I'm Archana Salanki. The big corporate story that we're tracking, the CBI has got three-day custody of former CEO of ICICI Bank, Chanda Kocher, and her husband, Deepak Kocher. The couple was arrested by the CBI last night in Delhi. The arrest is in connection with the alleged irregularities in a 3,000 crore rupees loan given to the Videocon group when Chanda Kocher was heading the private sector bank. Both Chanda and her husband were produced in the CBI court today. The CBI alleged non-cooperation by the coaches as reason for the arrest, while the defense counsel objected, calling it an illegal move and not in compliance with the law. The defense also argued that the CBI did not have any approval from a competent authority to make this arrest. My colleague Santhya Gora joins us on this uh, update. Uh, Santhya, what really happened in the court, the defense and uh, the public prosecutor both had uh, their arguments uh, calling the arrest illegal. What is the latest that you can share with us? So, Ashna, CBI sought a custody of three days of uh, both Achanda Kochar and Deepak Kochar. And CBI once again repeated in the court that the reason CBI had to place the Kochar couple under arrest was because when confronted with fresh documents and new evidence, the Kochar couple failed to cooperate, uh, did not give a proper clarification, failed to clarify uh, the allegations which were made by the CBI. That's why CBI didn't have any other option but to place the Kochar couple under arrest. Now, talking about the defense arguments, uh, defense first called uh, the arrest illegal. It claimed that CBI did not comply uh, with the set norms. Of course, uh, the defense went ahead and cited Arnish Kumar judgment. Defense also said that considering Chanda Kocher, who actually was a public servant, uh, Chanda Kocher arrest as per uh, the Prevention of Corruption Act under the section of 17A of Prevention of Corruption Act according to uh, this was this is what uh, th that was defense's argument Arjuna that CBI was supposed to take the permission from uh, the competent authority before arresting Chanda Kocher and CBI did not do that so C that means that CBI did not uh, this arrest was not in compliance with the law now talking about the CBI CBI claimed that CBI in fact uh, got the approval from the competent authority but when the court asked the agency to produce the approval uh, cbi couldn't produce that approval apart from that uh, amit desai advocate amit desai who was representing the coacher couple in the court also claimed uh, that if we have to believe it if it has to be believed that there is a fraud let's say there is a fraud cbi if cbi believes that a scam did take place why the beneficiary of those 3000 crore rupees which uh, is uh, venu gopal dhut in this case was not arrested but the coacher couple was arrested responding to that allegation cbi uh, uh, informed the court that venu gopal dhut was cooperating with the agency that's why the agency didn't find the need to make the arrest now talking about the non cooperation part of it, Archana, uh, the defense argued that can the CBI explain the non-cooperation because the FIR which was filed in 2019 and all these years the coacher couple was not summoned by the CBI. It was only in July 2022 for the first time that CBI summoned both the coachers and both of them they adhered uh, with the summon and they appeared before the CBI. It was in December 2022 after that on 19 December that the second summons were issued. Uh, the coachers are requested for a time for a new date that was 23rd of December and with the permission of CBI officer the date was postponed and on 23rd of December the coachers appeared before the CBI so the defense argued that where is the question of non-cooperation here to that the CBI said that when confronted with the new documents and fresh evidence the coacher couple did not clarify hence the need uh, hence the arrest was made so this is what tra happened in the court archana cbi sought a custody of three days and the court granted the custody of both the coachers for three days to the cbi archana right santhya for the benefit of our viewers could you help us understand the watertight case that the cbi is trying to build against chanda coacher and her husband what is the nature of allegations that these two people face So, Shna, based on uh, a complaint from a whistleblower, which uh, was followed by a media reportage, uh, in December 2017, CBI started conducting a preliminary inquiry uh, 
against both the coachers and Venu Gopal Dhut. It was in January 2019 that CBI finally filed the FIR. Chanda Kocher, uh, Deepak Kocher, Venu Gopal Dhut, uh, New Power uh, and Supreme Renewables Private Limited, uh, both of them owned by Deepak Kocher, unknown public servants and unknown private people were booked uh, as accused in that FIR. Now, this is what CBI's case is. CBI FIR says that while Chanda Kocher was at the helm of the bank as the MD and CEO of the bank between 2009 to 2011, six high-value loans were sanctioned by the bank to Venu Gopal Dhut's Videocon group of companies. Now, according to CBI, all these loans these they, uh, these loans were unsecured loans and they were uh, they violated rbi guideline banks credit policies and banking regulation act according to cbi out of these six loans uh, one in one of the loans that was rupees 300 crore rupee uh, in one, in that particular loan chanda kocher herself was a member on the sanctioning committee of that particular loan and there was a quid pro quo angle there while uh, and uh, while explaining this uh, quid pro quo angle cbi says that it was on 7th of september 2009 that this rupees 300 crore rupee loan was disbursed to videocon international and immediately after that the very next day that's 8th of september 2009 videocon uh, international transfers a loan of rupees 64 crore to a firm called New Power, and that actually is owned by Deepak Kocher. So CBI says that this is the quid pro quo angle here, and Chanda Kocher misused her position and sanctioned those loans to first Videocon group of companies while violating the set norms, and uh, that happened in exchange of those 64 crore rupees which were transferred by the Videocon group. Uh, to new power that is Chanda Kocher's husband's company. So this is CBI's case here, uh, Archana. And after CBI's FIR in 2019, again in January 2019 itself, ED also filed an ACIR in the case and booked all these accused for money laundering. In fact, ED also arrested in September 2020. ED also arrested Deepak Kocher, and uh, later after six months, uh, months he was released on bail. Uh, but talking about the Kocher couple here. Now the coacher couple is arrested by the CBI and is uh, and CBI has their custody for next three days now. All right, uh, thank you, Santhya, for those updates. Shifting focus to the other big story that we are tracking, that is the cabinet has announced a series of important decisions. To begin with, it has revised the one rank, one pension scheme for retired army personnel at an estimated additional annual expenditure of 8,400. 50 crore rupees, armed forces personnel who retired before 30th of uh, June 2019 uh, will be covered under this revision. Eligible recipients will receive arrears for a period between 1st of July 2019 to 30th of June 2022. The revision will benefit over 25 lakh armed forces pensioners. In another major decision, the cabinet approved minimum support price for COPRA for the 2023 season. The MSP has been fixed at 10,860 rupees per quintal for fair average quality of milling COPRA and at 11,750 rupees per quintal for ball COPRA. This decision is aimed at ensuring better remuneration returns to the coconut growers and improve their welfare. The highlight of yesterday's decisions is the merging of Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan An Yojana that was started in 2020 during COVID with the National Food Security Act. After this, more food grains will be made available free of cost to more than 800 million beneficiaries till December 2023 under National Food Security Act. Sapna Das is here with the details. Sapna, what is the fiscal impact of this decision? Well, finally, the government has been able to take a call in allowing the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan and the Yojana to actually sunset December 31. From Jan 1, the new regime under NFSA or other uh, free food grains via PDS, uh, you know, that will get operationalized from Jan 1 onwards the entire calendar year. The government upfront has given the uh, estimated food subsidy arising out of that and that's 2 lakh odd crores. Uh, now, we are given to understand that the additional cost because of food grains going free uh, under PDS from Jan 1 is likely to be 20 to 25 odd thousand crores for the entire calendar year. Uh, you know, this is significantly lower than whatever additional costs the government has incurred in terms of higher food subsidy bill due to the PMGKY extensions. 
uh, that's one the second significant part of course is that even this 2025 odd thousand crores which is hardly 0.1 percent of the gdp uh, has been included in the two lakh crore estimate given out by the government so i think uh, there is uh, there is room for ample fiscal savings for the government i think that's going to fare very well in terms of managing the food subsidy as well as taking care of the weaker sections of society all right, uh, thank you, Sapna, for uh, those updates. Uh, with that, it's time for a short break. When we return, we'll get you the latest on Reliance Capital. Race for Reliance Capital gets fierce. Torrent Investments has returned to Reliance Capital's administrators. We'll tell you. Welcome back on to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. The race for Reliance Capital is getting heated up. We learned that Torrent Investments has written to the Reliance Capital administrators in protest of Hinduja Global's revised bid for the debt-ridden company. Remember, Torrent had emerged as the highest bidder in auction for Reliance Capital's resolution process. But Hinduja surprised with a revised higher offer subsequently topping Torrent's proposal. Now, Torrent says that consideration of the new offer is in violation of the entire process. Ritu joins us with more. Ritu, what is the latest that you can share with us? That's right, Archana. Uh, you know, uh, Torrent has now raised an objection to the higher offer that has come in from Hinduja uh, outside of the e-auction process that was concluded. Remember, we reported earlier that Hinduja, uh, Torrent actually had emerged as the highest bidder in the e-auction round with an offer of 8,640 crores. Hinduja was the second highest at the time with 8,110 crores of an offer. But, you know, after the auction concluded and Torrent was given a letter by the uh, lenders and administrator affirming that they had indeed made the highest bid, Hinduja submitted a revised offer with an NPV of close to 9,000 crores, which includes 8,800 crores in cash. And that is certainly higher than any other offer that Reliance Capital had received so far. So objecting to this, Torrent has now written to the administrator of Reliance Capital saying that this uh, accepting a revised offer after the e-auction has concluded would be in violation of the IBC process. And they've said that they want an immediate confirmation from both the administrator and the COC that such an offer will not be accepted uh, and that it is, uh, you know, uh, illegal for the COC to de do so. They also reiterated that, uh, you know, in a December 17th call, they had specifically raised an issue uh, with regards to any revised bids being accepted after the process is closed, and they were reassured that that would not be done. And now that this has happened, uh, you know, they're just seeking a reassurance that the revised offer will not be conducted, and the COC will stand by the fact that the sanctity of the e-auction will be maintained and Torrent's offer would be considered. All right. Uh, thank you, Ritu, for those updates. All right, uh, moving on, as COVID infections across China and other countries continue to rise, India's health ministry has made RT-PCR tests mandatory for international travelers arriving from countries like China, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong and Thailand. Health Minister Mansuk Manviya has said that any passenger from these countries who is either found symptomatic or tests positive for COVID will be quarantined. Chin, Japan... दक्षिण कोरिया हांगकांग बैंकॉक सभी से आने वाली फ्लाइट पर हम एविएशन मिनिस्ट्री के साथ बातचीत करके तुरंत ही एयर सुविधा पोर्टल का इम्प्लीमेंटेशन करके सभी पैसेंजर को आरटीपीसीआर कंपलसरी करेंगे उसका ट्रेसिंग करना चालू कर देंगे और इंडिया में आने के बाद किसी को बुखार मालूम पड़े या तो टेस्ट पॉजिटिव पाया जाए तो तुरंत ही हम उसको क्वारंटाइन करने के लिए भी आदेश जारी करने जा रहे हैं मीन वाइल द हेल्थ मिनिस्ट्री हेज ऑल्सो डायरेक्टेड ऑल स्टेट्स टू मेंटेन एन एडिक्वेट सप्लाई ऑफ ऑक्सीजन एंड लाइफ सपोर्ट इक्विपमेंट इन अ लेटर द मिनिस्ट्री हेज सेड दैट ऑल कंसर्न डिपार्टमेंट्स मस्ट इंश्योर दैट पी एस ए प्लान्स आर केप्ट फुली फंक्शनल एंड रेगुलर मॉक ट्रिल्स आर बींग कंडक्टेड टू चेक दैम in other national headlines tragic news coming in from bihar when nine people lost their lives after an explosion took place at a brick kiln in the state's motihari district the incident took place after a chimney of the brick kiln exploded the injured have been hospitalized prime minister modi has announced a compensation of 2 lakh rupees to the next of the kin of each deceased and 50000 rupees for the injured 
U.S. President Joe Biden has nominated Indian-American lawyer diplomat Richard Verma to a top diplomatic position in the U.S. State Department. Verma has previously served as U.S. Ambassador to India from 2015 to 2017 and is currently the Chief Legal Officer and Head of Global Public Policy at MasterCard. Once confirmed by the Senate, he would serve as the Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources, making him the highest-ranking Indian-American in the State Department. Absorption at decadal high, massive decline in inventories, a sharp increase in prices across segments. These are just some of the highlights for the residential real estate sector in 2022. CNBC TV 18's Sonal Butra wraps up the realty sector and highlights possible risk to the upcycle. 2022 was about a lot of things. An uptick in real estate cycle is definitely something worth highlighting. We are talking about a steep uptick in residential demand and sales. So let's look at some numbers now. Absorption in residential real estate is not one, two or three or high, but at a decadal high. Absorption in residential real estate is basically the amount of space or units which are occupied within a market over a given period of time, typically one year. In calendar year 2022, so far, it is at 447 million square feet, which compares with 400 to 425 million square feet that we have seen in past couple of years. It even dipped to 281 in 2017 when the cycle was undergoing some decline. While absorption is increasing, inventories have been declining. Unsold inventory was a big pain point for developers as supply was exceeding demand. But now trends are seeing a reversal. Ready to move in inventory is declining. From levels of 849 billion in 2019, it is now around 500 billion, and that is a big decline. That is for ready to move in inventory, which was still more resilient than under construction. So, if we look at the under construction segment, that has declined from calendar year 19 to calendar year 2022. Calendar year 2019, remember, saw a massive increase in inventories. So, barring Hyderabad, in the top cities, there is a decline. 23% for Mumbai, 29% for Bengaluru, 14% for Chennai, 20% for Gurugram, 4% for Delhi, 34% for Pune. Only Hyderabad saw an increase of 145% in inventories. Decline in inventories was accompanied by increase in prices. We have been speaking to a whole host of developers and they have been of the view that passing on price hikes in the last quarter was not very difficult. So price hikes in the September quarter in some geographies have been massive. 3-4% in Mumbai, 14% quarter on quarter for Delhi NCR, 30% by Y there. Hyderabad has seen a 10% price increase. Navi Mumbai at 14% YOI, up 8% sequentially, and Chennai has seen a decline sequentially, but an increase on a YOI basis. Bengaluru and Pune have also seen moderate price hikes. This is across the industry, including organized and unorganized players. But some experts are of the view that maybe it will not be easy to pass on price hikes now, considering the massive hike in interest rates as well as the inflation. If you look at how listed players have done, strong first half of FY23, more than 100% growth in some cases. Prestige, Macrotech, Mahindra Life Spaces saw more than 100% growth. We have Godrej Properties in DLF with more than 60% growth in bookings, Obro at 92%, the likes of Sobha, Kolte, Patel, Brigade and Suntech between 20 to 50%. So, what could the risk to this massive rally be? Definitely rising interest rates. RBI has hiked rates to 6.25% in last few policy meets. And we did ask some big real estate names and DLF told us that demand for real estate sector was impacted when mortgage rates were at 9%. While prestige estates told us if mortgage rates cross 9%, it will impact real estate demand. So rate action from the RBI will be key to watch. Ending this data with some news we got some time back. This is related to commercial real estate, but only goes on to show the impact of rising rates. Blackstone and Starwood Funds Limited saw withdrawals from their real estate funds, and this was following surge of redemption requests. Big and small investors were queuing up to pull money out of real estate funds, which is a sign that yes, the surge in interest rates is threatening to impact at least the commercial property sector. These are two isolated cases, but whether it starts to have an impact on the entire sector, we'll wait and watch. And uh, with that, it's a wrap. Uh, thank you for watching, but don't go anywhere. News continues on the other side.